Travel, travel writing and travel literature are ancient activities. Where we as travellers, or indeed as readers of travel literature, are introduced to new places and all the wonders they can reveal to us. We can learn about a place's society, its history, its people and their politics and culture, their language, food, music and art. We can learn the folklore, the geography and the archaeology of a new site. We can learn about the local tales and fables in mythology and about real political upheavals, about natural and man-made disasters that shape a land and its people, about the rebels and patriots who were revered or vilified by a community and its citizens, and about so much more. This year for Galway Public Library's Great Read programme, we want to take you on a ramble through some of the beauty and the wonders of County Galway, as discovered and seen through the lens of several travel writers that have gone before us. We invite you to journey with us through time and place, to explore some of the sites where husband and wife team Samuel and Anna Maria Hall visited in the 1840s, a post-active union and pre-famine Ireland, with Sir William Wilde, an extraordinarily interesting and intellectual man with a passion for all things ancient, who wrote in the 1860s. The third writer we will journey with is Ulsterman Richard Hayward, an actor, singer, musician turned travel writer, exploring the highways and byways of the new and evolving Irish Free State between the 1930s and the late 1940s. Our guides on this ramble are two experts in all things Galway, Dr Jim Higgins and Michael Gibbons, each with a deep love and passion and wide-ranging knowledge of Galway's heritage and culture. So as Wilde said, let us westward ho. The earliest travel account we have of Connemara is a wonderful one, John Dunton. Dunton, of course, is a book dealer from Dublin. He's traveling west and he's really excited that all over Ireland, is, the Gaelic world has been destroyed, but he hears in Connemara, there's still the holdout of the old Gaelic elite. So in the valley here, he comes to the valley in 1698, guided by one of the O'Flaherty Lords, probably picked him up in my call and could even have been Rory O'Flaherty himself, the famous now dispossessed Gaelic Lord. He travels into the wild mountains here and he's at a hunting bully. So a bully is a, is a seasonal settlement in the mountains where cattle were brought, Mormon dairy cattle, and they were milked. And it was a whole part of the whole rhythm of life here in the mountains. But in the case of Dunton, he's lucky enough to be at a summer hunting party. So the Gaelic elite are here, they're in a long thatched house, there's a raised platform on one end. He describes, for example, them getting ready for a party. The women in the house peeing into the ashes off a turf fire and using the hot ashes to streak their hair. So a lovely little organic shampoo, late 17th century style. He described a priest, a whole retinue, and then they go hunting red deer in the valley here. So this was also a hunting park. Uh, belonging to the O'Flaherty's and we're at the edge of the O'Flaherty's and the Joyce world here. So we're in Duke of a Joyce country, bordering the O'Flaherty country and lots of tensions of course between these two powerful elites in the, in the 17th century. But this early account by Dunton of this hunting bully in the mountains here sets the scene for a later account uh, from the mid 18th century and then in the 1810 the Blakes travel through these mountains here with an armed party armed to the teeth guided by Joyce's and they go all the way out to the Rinvile Peninsula where they describe almost an identical house to the one that Dunton describes here so Glanlash a really important valley surrounded by the mountains of the Mam Turks. So Jim we're here on the edge of Bale and the Brack River in the edge of the Connemara Highlands very famous spot Mm. in terms of travel and people coming through the mountains here. Uh, as historically, of course, we're in Joy's country. Yeah. And in all the early travel accounts, we have references to the lake, the mountains, and the grandeur of the place as it emerges, as they walk westward from Kong and from Galway. So there's been people traveling here for literally millennia, using the lakes, bridle paths. But here at Cairns, put Cairns now at the edge of Nimmo's, Lodge, which later became a hotel. This was one of the key travel 
vectors into the Connemara Highlands. Yeah. And it was all by walking and by boat at the time until the, uh, until the trains came. Yeah, well what's really interesting also is that there's a long history of travel through here. I remember when we were, uh, I think we were still at college yeah. many years ago. You 1977. Came in, <laughs> you came in so excited that you had found in a very similar setting to this on the edge of the lake at the, on the Owen Riff River near Octorard. If I remember right, it was a band flake, a leaf-shaped spearhead. That's right, a Mesolithic stone point. And it was the first at the time west of the Shannon to be discovered. Yeah. Mm. So really early on, there's been travellers coming in, the first of them 7,000 years. And then fast forwarding into the 17th century, if you like, we have the beginnings of modern travel writers coming through this area. It's the end of the 16th century. The 17th century wars are over and dusted. The Irish are comprehensively defeated. More settled times. And so from the end of the 17th century onwards, you've got this beginning is of the adventure traveler poking his nose in, edging into the Connemara Highlands. And uh, so the very first of them we have is John Dunton. And he leaves a wonderful account of his travels through this very region we're in now. So uh, that's followed by Chief Baron Edward Willis, I think. He's in the 80, early 18th century. Then as you go on, you have Ingalls in the early 19th century of Halls. And then you have a few, couple of huge highlights, of course. Wild being one of the big ones, and later Hayward. So, and of course, there's a whole range of other lesser known ones as we go through, and we'll be exploring those as we, as we travel through this lovely landscape here. So at the moment, we're at the edge of the lake, and Dunton's account at the very beginning of that travel series of, of, of talks, I suppose, is one of the most fascinating of them. Well, Dunton, I suppose, a counterpoint to Dunton really would be O'Flaherty, because he was writing from an Irish perspective. You know, even Dunton, they do consult with the people who are the Irish antiquarians of the time as well. Yeah, yeah so they're not just travelling willy-nilly. They're picking no. out intelligent, informed people travelling through. And I suppose that's what Wilde is railing against as well. You know, from the 1830s, a huge number of travellers coming to Ireland. And they're given an awful lot of piggery and pokery and about the Colleens and whatever. And what Wilde is saying is he's looking at it from the point of view of a, our antiquarian past and how yeah. wonderful it is. And he was in the great position to be able to, to talk about his antiquarian past because he had catalogued the collections of the Royal Irish Academy and all that. But he states clearly that he is guiding people who were interested in, in antiquities and who were interested in Ireland's past. And he is not interested in giving the, 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 the sham roguery yeah. and so on. And of course, Wilde is well positioned here because they have a house in Maitura just outside Khan, and they have another house, which we'll see later in, on the way to Lethegesh. It's on the lake there, a stunning location. Hmm. So the Wilde, of course, Francesca Wilde, William, Sir William Wilde, as he became known, father of Oscar Wilde, in case you were thinking about Oscar Wilde, um, she was a folklorist. So they, they really appreciated that what they were looking at reference in Dunton again is not the last of the wild barbers are the last of the Gaelic Irish at yeah. an elite level with their culture intact though fading so that's their huge interest so you have a variety of different attitudes from the travel writers but they're all fascinating and, and as we walk on we'll, we'll, we'll talk about them as we go along but here this setting here I think is really lovely because you have the yeah. backdrop of the mountains here yeah. and that's one of the things that people hits them immediately, these wild mountains that they're traveling through. And they were wild at the time because there was no yeah. roads as such here. They were traveling in by boat quite a lot. Wild, as you say, in particular was traveling by boat. Chief Baron Edward Willis, their officials, they're called English officials, they're coming up here by boat, they're fishing on the lake. Yeah. And then there's bridle paths. There's no roads here until the beginning of the 18th century. And uh, the, the first road really into this part of the valley was built by Alexander Nimmo, and this was his beautiful house up here on the hill. And that becomes the, the focal point for all subsequent travellers through the valley here. And there's a lovely engraving of it in, uh, in Halls, Ireland. And people refer to it, Wilde refers to it as his pay office as well, his dwelling. It became a hotel and, um, you know, the tradition was that people, when they were being paid, went in one of the doors at, on the upper level 
and went out the other door once they were paid. We'll head on, Jim, here, because there's a, we have a lot to explore yet on our, on our journey through the Connemara Highlands. Isn't it a wonderful setting? Yeah, it's extraordinary. We're in the sort of northern end of the Man Valley here in this magnificent little Ulta Bioga, it's called. It's a little early church site, dominated by Joyce's, some mollusks, kinds, and of course the Omalias are associated with this valley more than any other family. And Jim, the other interesting thing is here, in the valley from the Bronze Age onwards, you have the use of white quartz. And quartz comes in white, and it also comes in a sort of pink colour. Travel accounts of Connemara are very interesting and the Halls were one of the most famous of the travel writers to come through this area. Yeah. I don't know a huge amount about them. Yeah. Can you tell us about just their significance and where they come in into the story of travel writing here? Well they're highly significant. Scores of travel writers that come here since the 1830s in particular. But the Halls are the ones that really made their money out of travel writing. Uh, Anna Maria Hall left Ireland when she was 16, went to England. Samuel Hall, he was born of uh, English parents from a military ba background, born in Portobello Barracks, went to England. He was involved in all sorts of journalism, publishing, he published arts magazines and so on. So he was well used to the publishing industry. Anna Maria was writing stories and tales about Ireland. She caught up on this whole interest in folklore and folk tales mm -hmm. that was current at the time. And from the 1820s, 1830s, she was beginning to write folk tales. As a pair, together, they were highly successful. They brought out a wonderful book called Ireland, its scenery and its character. And in a way, it was, it was a deluxe travel book. It was originally brought out in parts by the 1840s, 1841, 42 was being published. 1843, you had a three-part set and that went into numerous editions, deluxe editions, American editions and so on. So they were writing about the whole of Ireland, not just yeah. this area here. But this is a sort of valley and this is a sort of area that they took great delight in. This was the sort of the wild Ireland the Irish Highlands as, that they refer to yeah. and this was the sort of area that they thrived on. Wilde, uh, his area was really the Corrib, he didn't really come as far west as here. Yeah. What's interesting about the Wilde is his Wilde La Corrib is the focus, though they do have a house further west. In his travel account, if you like, he doesn't come quite as far north as here. Yeah. He stops sort of on, on the carb itself. He doesn't travel up. So that's why the, the halls are important as well, in that they're describing all this journey through the valley here and further, further west as we go along. Well, they had an international audience as well, and they dedicated their book to Prince Albert, uh, uh, His Royal Highness Prince Albert, and they made sure that, uh, that, that they had all of these people on board. They brought artists with them as well. Now, most travel books were illustrated by engravings and so on. Uh, engravings in wood, engravings in metal and so on. Now, the halls used the work of various artists. Fairholt, for instance, people who had illustrated material for the Journal of the British Archaeological Association. But they also brought with them, on two of their trips, um, Evans of Eton. Now, he was the son of an art teacher and he was a great artist himself. He taught art at Eton. There's a wonderful collection of his watercolours. Yeah, one, uh, and actually one of the watercolours, because I got to identify where they were, was actually off this particular site that we're in. It, and exactly, it's a beautiful, yeah. beautiful image of it. Yeah. But what's also amazing about the halls is that there's a big investment in their publications, and it's published and sells out. So there is an audience forage among the British public yeah. in the pre-famine times. So there's a, the, the beginnings of that adventure travel excitement about Ireland. You know, Ireland is on the agenda for the travel market. It's not just heading off on the Grand Tour. The Grand Tour now extends well into the west of Ireland, all over across the Highlands. And they're picking up on that, the burgeoning middle class, if you like, of, of, of Victorian England. They're picking up on it. And that's their market, that's of right. course. And it's a huge market. And um, 
Evans, William Evans, benefited greatly. He was able to go to his students and he was able to maybe go to their, the, the houses of their parents, uh, do watercolours and whatever. He had, a, he had an instant market there, but he exhibited widely yeah. all over the world. And what's, what's interesting about the accounts though is some accounts are looking at the, the romantic scenes, the mountain, the peasants in the street, the fishermen on the shore. But there's also underlying that, you know, unbelievable poverty which they gloss over to a degree, because once you hit the west of Ireland here, this was a seriously impoverished part. So some commentators are commenting on it, others it's a bit of decoration uh, to sort of decorate the natural wonders that they're going through. And the area was heavily lived in. You can just look around here, and if you look closely, you'll see on any of the ridges here, you'll see that there was an immense amount of cultivation here. Yeah, one, one of the stage. early accounts actually describes seeing the ridges on the mountainside and says uh, there were clearly old ridges that were referenced that the Danes built them. Yeah. So while we look at these cultivated running right up the hillside here in the 18th century as the population is booming, there are other elements in the landscape as with this site and the fort further down that are going, and the quartz. Yeah. You know, there's quartz standing stones here in the, in the area as well. One of the things though, Jim, is nearly every site we visit, you always pick up on a feature that I've been at around and looked at and actually not seen. And this fantastic example here of a grave slab with your quartz cross and the quartz referencing the sacred and symbolic color, purity, innocence, death, hope for the la afterlife you have it here on this grave and as the quartz here this grave is clearly still tended if you like uh, but the gravestone itself is quite fascinating something i had missed out on when i first surveyed this many years ago it is because you know even on the arden islands you go to the arden islands places which uh, where, where where the language is widely spoken or connemara whatever it wasn't really up until the present century that people began again to inscribe inscriptions in Irish. This is an interesting one because there was a sort of revival of the use of Irish uh, in places like Louth in the 18th century. In parts of the west of Ireland, that revival didn't take place until after the Gaelic League had been established. But here you have an interesting one because the inscription starts off a hearna, our Lord, or Lord Jane Troker, and our something like that is, is the first line of the inscription and then it breaks into English. Now the interesting thing is that they use on Clo Gaelic the Gaelic font to inscribe the Irish and they use the Roman letters then to inscribe the English language inscription which occupies most of the stone. Oh. Now interesting it's John Wallace and uh, this family were still here and uh, um, the 1901 census for instance has, has mentions of them and obviously the grave is still uh, beautifully tended and, uh, and, but the, and the significance of it being in Irish is important and that it was all Irish speaking. And anybody interested in fishing and all of that, Hayward for instance in his travel books, he always is, is interested in this area because of its scenery and because of the fact that it isn't populated yeah. by the 1940s and that's the attraction then because it, it isn't populated so it still has the wildness but the, the irony is that it was far more populated in the 18th century than Hayward would have us believe. Yeah. Now, Hayward is an interesting character. When he's writing about this area, his emphasis is mainly on either fishing or scenery. But an interesting feature of his books is that he shows, he displays an interest in the Irish language. He, he has, he uses the Clough Gaelic uh, for Irish place names yeah. and he tries to analyse the place names and he, he gives the place names in Irish in all his travel books about Ireland which is interesting and for somebody who, who uh, was a member of uh, the Orange Order yeah. it's equally interesting. Yeah well the other thing about it, a lot of the early travel accounts are describing cattle and goats whereas yeah. now the landscape is dominated by sheep but yeah. of course up till 1800 there was wolves here so you couldn't have had lots of flocks of sheep. So there's another sort of, when you read through the travel accounts, you can look at aspects of the natural world that's coming and going. The age of cattle is moving out as they move into sheep production big time from, from 1800 onwards particularly. And that's, you, you'll see that in the travel logs as well, in the various accounts. And in, also in particular in Evans, some of Evans's 
uh, drawings, Bartlett's drawings, similarly, you yeah. know, you've got, um, it's cattle that are, that are illustrated as more so than sheep in, mm. the, in these mountains. I mean, this is a really fascinating site. So they were coming out here by car, in other words, horse-drawn vehicle. The Anconies were often referred to by the halls and by, by wild, and they were short, sometimes the word was shortened to by Anne. But uh, in some cases, wild travelled alone by horse. In other cases, the wild travelled by, you know, yeah, exactly, you know. And um, so they were seeing the landscape uh, in a way that, Hayward would not have seen it. You know, they would have seen it in a more intimate way, yeah. really. You know, slow travel. Slower travel, exactly. Yeah. Well, what, one of the features that you get is that, you know, as they come westward, they often came out from Galway, out through Mam Cross, sometimes up the Mam Valley. But it was like a two-day tour you could book on. But yeah. one of the places they marvel at is Kylemore Valley, and then as you're heading northward of Killary Harbour, just around here, just above us here. And, and you know, this yeah. was one of the huge attractions for, and that's why Lean Ann Hotel was built where it was, because it's at the interface of the mountain passes of Mam, the Killary, Galway, Connemara, Murrisk, the Barony of Ballinahange, all around the area here. Yeah. And it was an area that had travellers coming in and out of it for literally centuries. The 18th century harbours were, were like the one behind us here. There was smuggling coming in, boats from here going to as far south as Cadiz, Vigo, yeah. La Rochelle. So this had a history of travel and some of the early travellers, of course, are coming up the car by boat. They're coming with armed parties guarded by the Joyces. Yeah. And then they're hopping onto boats at Leenan, travelling westward to Saw Rook. And just west of us here where the halls later went to, you have the pa famous Pass of Saw Rook. Mm. And that was one of the big destinations because it has such a spectacular part of the landscape and travellers often went to gentry houses you know they were, they were on a tour mm -hmm. with a card a letter of introduction and one of the places some of them headed to were the Blakes of Rinvile but also uh, General Thompson's house in yeah. Saw Rock. It was like the Georgian Society in a way going on a tour of the, <laughs> the local gentry and the big houses yeah. but they would have this pier here they would have been able to go across at this fording point across yeah, exactly. the Kittery as well. Because this was the ferry point yeah. going across to Bundurka, which the, you can see the, the key across here. So this yeah. was one of the major crossing points because yeah. it saved you this huge journey in and around the Carob. So very significant part of the, the travel architecture, yeah. if you like, off the area is this here harbour behind us. And of course, in 1907, you had the Royal Navy coming in here and you have the wonderful shots of the Royal Naval Fleet in the harbour behind us here. Yeah. So lots of history associated with the area here. And even over here, you know, the expression, dragging the devil by the tail. <laughs> I believe that could be applied to that notch in the hill over yeah, here well at that, Rock. That's the notch where the devil, having chained to the ground by saying Rock, makes a run for it. And the chain bites down and that gives us the pass, one of the features at the pass of Cell Rock is that notch cut down through the rock coming from Bunahoun yeah. over to uh, Little Killery itself. And this was always equated with the, with, with the Scandinavian fjords, of course. Yeah. That, this was what people came to see. And as you can see, even today, yeah. you, know, you have people traveling on it because it's the fjord. It's the only proper fjord in Ireland today. Yeah. Fascinating place. We're here on the edge of this very historic little valley, a little gym, a jewel in fact. A lot of the travellers' accounts are actually heading for here because General Thompson is here in the 19th century. And he's complimented on his contribution to the landscape, improving it, planting trees, building new farms, building roads, harbours, keys, the whole works, including a little Anglican church which is in, just tucked away in the trees behind us close to the site of the original church, which is a very famous place because we have great accounts of it uh, from the 19th century. And that was the original Saw Rook, ruined monastery with its two holy wells. We'll be seeing that later. But General Thompson, the family are still here. They're Thompson Willoughby's. So they're the Willoughby's now, a rare example of a 19th century family, early 19th century, who are still in residence. Their estate, their 8,000 acre estate is long gone. So it's a hugely important house to have its original family, its original archives. And the Thompson, General Thompson, firebrand evangelical, 
uh, Anglican missionary, if you like. So he's civilizing the landscape, but he's also converting the local population here with inducement on occasion. But he's actually good to his own tenants in that he brings, he describes the importing of food in here during the famine times and builds a, a barn on the edge of the tide here when he brings supplies in from Westport. But he comments at one stage when the ships are coming in uh, that all the, the boatload of aid coming into his own tenants is robbed by the starving islanders further out. So this area here is very well documented among a series of travel accounts from the early 19th century onwards by the Blakes, by the Halls and the Wilds later on. So it's just the whole natural setting here is so beautiful. A desert oasis in the middle of the wild Colmar Mountains. So we're in this incredible ancient graveyard here. The Willoughby's, Thompson Willoughby's, the landlords are on top of the hill. This is the Dean ordinary people, but it's on an ancient site, the early monastic site. And if I'm right or wrong, this is, w was the sort of classic site for travellers coming through because of the sort of exotic features you would see here. The traditional graves, the wild mountains all around it. But then the tradition of placing a clay pipe on a grave was very much a feature of this. And the Belfast Naturalist Club, among the features and among the members, was one man in particular who recorded the clay pipe tradition here. I've forgotten his name now, Jim. Will you give us some context on, on, on his name again? I've forgotten his name. Yeah, well, Robert L. Welch, he, he, was, he was a member of the Royal Society of Antiquaries of, the, uh, of a huge number of feed clubs. He was a photographer, professional photographer, and he had a great interest in antiquities, archaeology, history in general. And he took two photographs. And those two photographs ended up in what we might term commercial travellers' guidebooks. There was a whole series of these commercial uh, guidebooks. Uh, the Great Southern and Western Railway, for instance, uh, they had their own guidebook to the country. And his photographs of the clay pipes on the graves ended up in that. And what was the significance of the clay pipes uh, on the grave? Well, Where that was all part from? of the wake tradition. All oh, right, OK. The clay pipes were given out free, like yeah. confetti at a wedding, whiskey yeah, at a okay. wake, all of these things were given out free. It was part of the hospitality of the wake. And sometimes people would take home the clay pipes. In other traditions, what they would do is bring the clay pipes to the graveyard and place them on the grave of the deceased. And that was a tradition here in Salrock. It was a west of Ireland tradition, really. Yeah. Uh, you had it in Renville as well. And then you had it in Ackle, places like that. But it was sufficiently unusual for Welsh to associate it with an Exo unusual tradition. An, an exotic tradition. An exotic tradition, here. exactly. That, that, that was it, really. And of course, know. that's behind so much of the travel writing in the 18th and 19th century. It's Connemara is exotic. The women are wearing petticoats. Yeah. The men are wearing braid jeans. Mm -hmm. And the whole culture, of course, is one of the things they, they comment on. Even the most impoverished families will have a good send off. So that was having the clay pipes and the whiskey was people would spend a lot of money yeah. f on the burial, actual burial itself, even though they had very little themselves. Well, it's a survival. And it's mm. like when people, you know, what's exotic is what becomes noticed. Yeah. And the wilds refer to this, the halls refer to this, they refer to the dress of the Irish people, in other words, the, the red petticoats, the, the blue cloaks and so on. We'll be, we'll be going on now further west from here to the Blakes, to Renville House. That's right. And, yeah. and they also are describing this exotic world that they have, they're moving into around 1812 when they, they come for the first time here. Well, the other thing about it is that um, Sir William Wilde did a guidebook to Badira. And the thing that is important about Madeira is the thatched houses. That's what yeah. people notice today. There's yeah. very few of them left. Yeah. But the other thing that they notice, and you see all the prints of and all the tourist tack, is of the traditional dress. So he noticed the traditional dress in Madeira. Yeah. People coming into Ireland notice the fact that people go to an immense amount of expense. Tackery, for instance, describes how you have a man holding his wife's uh, shoes and stockings in his hand walking ahead of her and she's there in her bare feet behind him but she has beautiful uh, well-maintained beautiful dress and uh, you know it has the the the, uh, the red lining and the and the blue cloak and whatever and Thackeray's comment on about uh, you know well it, it must have been an expensive set of clothes.
That's a fantastic island retreat for the wilds. Yeah, it is. It's on its own little peninsula jutting into the lake, surrounded by woodlands, classic sort of gentry, a hunting lodge. Yeah. In fact, it was a fishing lodge that they used. And uh, Oscar, of course, the famous son of Francesca and William Wilde, wrote letters there as a young teenage boy fishing in the lake. And of course, both his parents were incredible in that the amount that they published in their lifetime in lots of different mm. fields. Francesca published on the folklore of Ireland, and in particular the she to the fairy legends of Connemara, and the islands in particular, the islands behind us, Inish Shark, Inish Boffin, and a wonderful collection of stories about the she mm. that she recorded at the time on the islands here. Yeah, and of course, you know, William, his Beauties of the Boyne and Blackwater, and his book on the Corrib, the uh, Corrib, its shores and its islands, and notices of Loch Mask. Those were the two classic books of his. And uh, apart at all from his catalogue of the, um, all the ant ant antiquarian collection in the Royal Irish Academy. Yeah, one of the finds which he mentions collecting in Connemara at the time were three polished marble axe heads found under a tree at Octorard. Yeah. And uh, he also ha illustrates some stone moulds from the Bronze Age uh, carved out of soapstone. And there was actually one of them found here in Colfin. Uh, he doesn't illustrate it, but it's a famous mould from right just down the road from where we are here. So mm -hmm. the wives were just an incredible, complicated family. And of course, she wrote for the Nation newspaper under a pseudonym, Speranza, yeah. while he was being knighted for his contribution to the empire. And he also, he made a point in his book on the Corrib, he made the point that he wasn't going to be involved in party politics. And he specifically mentions that he wasn't going to mention the Fenians, he wasn't going to mention Young Ireland, and he wasn't going to mention so, so, on, so many other things. And of course, his wife was involved with all the Young Irelanders. Yeah, so complicated family history over dinner. But once he was knighted, of course, she seems to drop her revolutionary uh, credentials, and he was knighted for his study of the Great Famine in Ireland. That's one of the great studies that he did. And that's what he actually got his knighthood for, not for his antiquarian work, yeah. but for his uh, analysis as a doctor of the effects and the, the terrible tragedy that the Great Famine inflicted on these, on these landscapes. One of the guys who comes after him, of course, in the same area is Hayward. And he describes this amazing stone fort, almost within sight of the wilds, hunting fishing lodge on, on Loch Muck and Loch Fee and it's literally about a mile and a half just further west down the valley and it's up on the top of a spur it's a stunning early Christian maybe Iron Age fort one of a whole series that goes from the Carob up through Glen Lash where we were earlier down into Glen Croft and all along at strategic points you have these stunning little stone forts and Hayward is the first one in print to mention that lovely stone fort up on the bluff between the Loch Muck and Loch Fee. And the Halls came to this area and brought Evans of Eaton with them. Yeah, and Eaton, uh, Evans of Eaton was very important because right here we are now, one of his classic and most important paintings was done. It was off a fisherman's cottage on the shore, literally one foot in the tide and the other on the land, Far Tal of his thraw, a man of the land and the sea, and you have a boat hauled up in front of it, a thatched house, almost certainly made from driftwood, the roofs are from Jusach, Bog Deal, and uh, some timbers holding down the roof, and in the background you have the clustered hamlet on the hill just to the west of us here, so it's really one of these classic scenes. The other one, of course, is further west at Rindwell House, and from here, along this coast, he sails uh, to make his other classic uh, painting, which is at Keem Bay, another fisherman scene, a cottage on the shore of that stunning beach, which you can see on a clearer day from here. So all three groups of writers were responsible for a lot, really. Yeah, I mean, they give us the, the, the big image. They, they, they're the marketing team, really, for the future tourism industry, which develops and grows legs for the next hundred years after their time. You know, Humbert Craig was brought along to illustrate one set of books by Hayward and Raymond Piper illustrated another. So really did an awful lot for the art world as well as for tourism, the antiquarian world and so on. Isn't it great to be here in the 
library. Uh, fantastic selection of books in front of us. Halls, Hayward, Flaherty's Era Connacht, and uh, all the all the people that we've been talking about all day. Yeah, and including least but last but not least, uh, the Blake family who wrote this account, which we republished a number of years ago. It's Letters from the Irish Highlands, but it's in the same vein of, of, of all the other ones that went before them. And, and that was written here. After. It was written here yeah. by Henry Blake, his wife, his English wife and sister-in-law. Yeah. And they came around between 1810 and 1812 for the first time. And in residence at the time was descendants of the O'Flaherty's, uh, a branch of them that survived here post 1700 cadet branch who were leased the, oh, the original O'Flaherty estate and were here so long and what a shock they got when the Blakes decided newly married to move to the west to take up that old forgotten estate that they owned and the house becomes important because it's a description of the long house very like the house that Rui O'Flaherty lived in or the house described in Lan Lash yeah. in that really that wonderful account and then of course the house is transformed into a a landlord's house and uh, so the Blake house becomes one of the most important houses it's not on a grand scale like Ballina Hinch mm -hmm. or Clifton Castle uh, but it's it's a literary house mm -hmm. and remains that way right through uh, history the, the Blakes hold on to it here they've survived the famine in the house and they themselves there's a lovely other account written by the Blakes one of the Blake descendants Right, as a 12 year old girl, she writes an account of growing up here as a child. Yeah. And of course, Gogarty, the great, great writer Gogarty, he lives and owns the house. And you have the other association because of his sort of, this sort of creative world he lives around. Yeats is here on his honeymoon. Yeah. There are seances in the house. Yeah. Lady Gregory is here. All that literary elite. Yeah. This is sort of a rival house to Cool Park. So there's a really a tremendous sort of literary history yeah. associated with Galway, Connemara, uh, and of course it informs Ireland, people's image of Ireland as well as coming out of all these publications. Well, it's interesting because, you know, wasn't it O'Flaherty as well? Wasn't it his aim to write about Ireland as an Irish person and to counter all the misinformation and that was out there about Ireland? So he was doing what the Blakes did in the early 19th century. O'Flaherty was doing it in the 1680s. And one of the last descriptions in O'Flaherty's book, Ear Connacht, is of this area here in Renville. Oh. Now this book wasn't, wasn't published as, as in book form, in, in printed form, uh, until uh, James Hardiman managed to edit it uh, for the Archaeological Society in the, uh, in, in the 1840s. But it was, a, it was an outstanding book. O'Flaherty was a great historian in the sense that he had written Ojidia, and that was to give a, a good impression of Irish history, a chronology of Irish history, and to counter all the, all the raw mesh that the, the, the foreigners thought. were writing about it. Yeah. And his West, we were Connacht then, published in, uh, written in 1684, that did the same for this area, in, in, the, in the sense that it was the first book written from an Irish perspective about an area that he knew well. He was born in um, Ochnanure Castle, so he would have been the last of the last of the O'Flaherty, uh, I Leage. suppose, hierarchy. Yeah. So very exciting place, and of course, what's lovely about it, the view from the window here. You're looking right on to Tully Mountain, yeah, yeah. but in the Neolithic tomb, that side of it, a medieval castle that survivors of the Spanish Armada came ashore. In northeast of it, from the other side of the hotel, you look at Crowpatrick, and you're looking north to Cahar Island, and the islands of Achill, where Evans travelled up to, and Clare Island. So it's really yeah. exceptionally important house. And you have Evans here. These are some of the sketches that Evans did. This is a volume three of Halls Ireland from the 1840s, 1843, and some of Evans' sketches decorated. And some of them are from this area. Yeah, there's some more. There's a couple of lovely ones also off where we were in Saw Rock, off, off the actual pass of Saint Rock. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so there's a, 
there wasn't this particular one here. Oh, Fairholt's drawing. Fairholt's yeah. drawing off the yeah. pass with the cairns on top of it, where the coffins were rested. The people from Fahar, which is on Killary Harbour, bringing their dead over the hill, through the pass, down into that lovely graveyard at Saw Rock. Yeah. And we have Hayward as well, and of course, Hayward, he had, he had some wonderful artists to illustrate his work. He had, um, and where was Hayward from again? What was his background? He was, he, well, he was, he was born in England, and he spent a lot of his time in the North. He was, became a member of the Orange Order, but he wrote a whole series of books on Ireland. On, on Ireland. Now, the two most relevant ones are the Corrib Country. And the first thing he says in the Corrib Country is, I'm not trying to emulate or try to outdo um, Wild. The other book then that he wrote it was part of a series. This is Ireland, Galway, Connacht and the city of Galway. Now, he started off with a book on Ulster. And then he went into another part of the This of Ireland, This is of Ireland series, and Connacht was one of the one of the later ones. And this one I particularly love. I have a, I have a great fondness for the drawings uh, by Raymond Piper. And uh, there's one of the, the Royal Abbey of Kong and so on. But I think Piper's sketches are absolutely fantastic. And you know we're surrounded by art here. Uh, the Coyle family have got books from St. John Gogarty's collection at auction. And all, all around the place here, you've got uh, artwork from the Celtic Revival and from the Revival of the House. And uh, it's a great setting to, to be yeah, in. Yeah, we're very fortunate that there's a family who's from a literary historical background as well, because some hotels, of course, don't have any. But this house does, it has it. So they've continued that literary interest and the history of Connemara and art. And yeah. And you can see it in the grounds as well, you know, the, it's just an exceptionally lovely place to yeah. to explore the literary travel history of Ireland. It's, it's great to be here. We've shown you a little of County Galway as seen by some amazing and very hardy travellers given their mode of transport in the 19th century. No warm vehicles or air-conditioned rooms for the halls are wild. Firstly, an expedition and examination by the halls of pre-famine Ireland and quoting from one of uh, their volumes where they talked about the different living conditions that were in Ireland at the time. And I quote, Their houses were heaps of rude stone uncemented, rounded at the gables, roofed with fern, heath and shingles, fastened on by straw beds. And then the rich detailed account by Wilde, written just a short number of years after the famine, but prior to the Land League. We then skipped some 60 years to see how Hayward viewed Ireland, the new emerging republic, where poverty Hardship, unemployment and immigration never seemed too far away. And yet, we still have a rich archaeological, historical and cultural heritage that is ours. Ours to nourish, protect and to be proud of. Learning about our past and how our forefathers worked, played and prayed helps us to learn something about ourselves. The DNA of our landscape shapes us and shapes how we work and play today. We hope our ramble, short as has been, has whetted your appetite enough to entice you to enjoy not just the literature that we have revisited today, but the fabulous sights dotted around our county. In the immortal words of Sir William Wilde, Westward ho, let us rise with the sun and be off to the land of the west. To the lakes and streams, the grassy glens and the fern-glad gorges, the bluff hills and rugged mountains, now snow-capped, now revealed in azure or bronzed by evening's tent as the light of day sinks into the bold swell of the Atlantic and leaves his reflection in long level streaks of crimson, green and orange. Among the greyish purple robe of twilight, 
when the shadows of the headlands sink deep into the placid waters of the lake.